everybody and welcome to another board gaming review and gameplay demo. Today I'm going to be talking about a game that I have held up many, many, many times as not only one of my favorite games, but also as a game that really does an expansion type very, very well. The game is Kingsburg and its expansion to Forge a Realm. The way that this game works is very simple. All that you do is you've got, uh, you've got players who have three dice each. You roll the dice and based on the numbers that come out on the, on the dice, then you're able to influence different uh, members of the king's court. And uh, based on who you are able to influence, you get different rewards from them, whether it's resources that allow you to build buildings or uh, whether it's uh, the ability to train and uh, get soldiers to protect yourself against the in oncoming hordes, whatever it happens to be. Either way, uh, it's very, very important and it's a great example of how you can turn something that is inherently random, in this case rolling dice, into something that becomes a heavily strategic element to the game. Because how you spend and how you use your dice really can affect what you're able to do and how quickly you're able to get things done. So it's a wonderful game. It's relatively quick, which is nice, and it plays a decent number of players. Um, the idea in the end is just victory points. That's how you win. It's a uh, strictly competitive game. Uh, whoever has the most VPs at the end wins the game, and you get those through numerous means, whether it's by building different buildings that grant you victory points, or by, uh, by simply, uh, well, all the buildings give you victory points, but some of them give you additional victory points, or by way of influencing, influencing specific uh, specific court members, uh, which will, are able to grant you uh, able to grant you victory points, whatever it happens to be. And also defending the kingdom also gives you victory points potentially. There's just all sorts of different ways to do it. I'll talk all about that when I go through the uh, the gameplay demo. But either way, it's a great example of a, a like I said, a wonderful way of doing expansions. The to forge a realm expansion expansion is what I uh, and many others commonly refer to as a modular expansion. The whole point of this is that you have different elements, any or all of which can be applied to the base game, just depending on what you want to play, how you want to play it, and how you want to change the overall gameplay style. And these range anywhere from eliminating some of the RNG in the game, all the way to completely changing what types of buildings you're able to build. It's absolutely amazing, and on top of that, it adds uh, additional uh, uh, influence capabilities uh, in the context of adding new and different cards that you're able to draw and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Absolutely great game. Kingsburg overall, a very fun game. A really, really good one and um, like I said, uh, relatively quick, uh, but not too quick compared to others, but decently strategic and the great thing is that not so heavily strategic that can that it'll turn off even the most novice of many, many players. But with that, I'll go ahead and uh, get started by talking a little bit about what this game is similar to. It can be relatively difficult to draw very good similarities for Kingsburg to other games. The closest thing that I can think of personally and the way that I play and the way I view this game is from the context of resource management. So the biggest thing I thought of was Power Grid. The idea being that you only have a limited number of items or uh, in this case resources, you know, you got the gold, wood, and stone that you're able to build with. Same thing in Power Grid. You have to look at the market, see what's where, how much you can get, how much it's going to cost, and most importantly, or arguably most importantly, how is it going to screw over all your friends? How is it going to mess up their plans? The biggest thing for this game, and many, many other games of the type that are that have that really good Euro feel, is being able to plan ahead, and most importantly, being able to follow through with that plan. If you're able to do that, then what you actually roll on the dice matters a lot less because you are able to mitigate a lot of the RNG in this game through uh, through numerous different ways, but primarily you're talking about uh, you know being able to get different resources at different levels, and the thing is that multiple people within the King's Court will give you the exact same resources, it's just a matter of how quickly can you get to them, and how badly do you need other different things. So that's why planning ahead is so, so vital. It's vital in this, it's vital in a game like Power Grid, even in some Something like Twilight Struggle, although obviously Twilight Struggle, much, much greater extent compared to Kingsburg, you're still just talking about the same basic principle of focus and planning, and that's it. You know, if you know that you need to get soldiers, then you need to go and get soldiers. If you know that you need to get gold, go and get some gold. Just stuff like that. That is really all that you're looking for. And 
overall it does a great job of balancing the real rigmarole and real difficulty of having to uh, have that really heavy resource management in a game that's still relatively simple to play and still a lot of fun. But either way, I'll get into all of that in just a couple of seconds because now it is time for the actual gameplay demo itself. Alright everybody, we're basically set up and ready to play Kingsburg. I know that it may look a little bit complex, but I'm going to go over every single aspect so that you know exactly what I'm talking about as I'm going through it. But first and foremost, just to go over some of the basic setup for the game, uh, we have the main board that should be within reach of everybody. Uh, obviously it's not too great for the way that my three players are set up here. Uh, the reason I'm playing with three players is that's the minimum that we need without using a dummy player because I really don't want to deal with that right now. But Everybody gets one of these play mats. Everybody gets a whole bunch of these markers to indicate what buildings they build throughout the game. Each person gets three dice representing their particular color, and everybody gets three wooden discs that they put on the board in their respective spots. You've got one that'll go around the victory track, which will keep track of just how many points you've got to see who wins at the end of the game. You've got one to show where you are in the turn order, and then you've got one to show how many troops you uh, end up up recruiting throughout the different seasons. So the way that this works is we go over the course of five years uh, effectively and during each year we have we go through the four seasons. We have spring, summer, fall, and winter and in between the seasons specific events occur but basically during spring, summer, fall, and winter we all roll our dice and depending on what the numbers are we will go and we will influence different people within the king's court. Uh, and the way that that works is you can either use a single number to influence a single person or you can add up two or all three of your dice to influence some specific person right very very simple and effectively each production season we will end up changing the order because it's based off of your die rolls whoever has the highest number will go last whoever has the lowest total number will be going first okay in addition to the wooden discs for each player there are also two purple discs that are for the game itself. Uh, we've got this one that tracks what part of the, of the year that we're in, and we've got this one that tracks what year we're actually in uh, throughout the game. Again, this goes for a total of five years. Up in the top right corner, we've got all of the material goods. We've got wood, gold, and stone, and then we have the two pip counters, which we can use to modify our die rolls as well. Okay, so the general goal of this game is that throughout this, we'll be earning uh, different materials materials of all different sorts and using those materials we will be building buildings in order to gain virtue and honor with the king represented by the victory points. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this. This is just the base game set up here and then I'm going to show you what to forge a realm adds to this game which is some pretty awesome stuff. Okay and I'll go through that. It's a great modular expansion. I'll show you each module but to start off I'm just going to go by this base game what you get to start off here. Okay. So the first thing that we do, we just uh, we start off in the spring production season. There's technically a little thing before spring, but we don't go through that because it's represented by the people who are sort of in the back, right? Throughout the game, uh, if you have fewer buildings, then you get help. If you have the most buildings, then you also uh, get help. You get more victory points because you are leading the pack and the king is proud of you. And then if you are also behind, then you get what's called the king's emissary, which can give you some special bonuses but then at the end during the winter time we have to fight some of the bad guys off and hopefully we will be able to defeat them so that we are able to uh, earn some cool stuff and at the very least avoid losing a bunch of stuff very badly okay the way that we do that primarily is by earning these various materials and using those to build buildings so this is a great example of a game that uses an inherently random 
thing, an inherently random mechanic, which in this case is rolling dice, and mitigates that to such a great extent by giving you some absolutely amazing ways of stopping that. So what I'll do right now is just go over some of the King's Court things, some of the things that might not be so obvious. Uh, first on the gesture here at number one, we've got the little flag. That represents a victory point. You see that on the cards as well. That's just a, a victory point straight up. You get that for rolling a one, right? And then you got the thing that looks like a bunch of lemons. That that represents gold. The wood is fairly obvious. If you've got the vertical split between one or more um, one or more materials, then you pick a set on either the left or the right. The shield with the cross swords represents uh, earning a soldier for that year. The uh, number six, the alchemist, means that you can trade in. You can trade in gold for a wood and a stone, wood for a gold and a stone, or stone for a gold and a wood, right? The other uh, sort of strange symbols are uh, this weird looking bag thing that you see in several places, and that just means you pick a specific resource, either the stone, the wood, or the gold. The other weird one is this pink ghost looking thing and what that allows you to do is to look at what the bad guy is going to be for this season so you know about how many soldiers you'll uh, need to get so what I'll do is I'll play through a full year so you can see the entirety of how this works and uh, you'll be able to, uh, to sort of get a really good feel for the game itself and how it goes along now just as a very brief um, a very brief uh, strategy for this game and uh, what you sort of want to look for is uh, regarding the buildings one thing that you really really want is to get the market you first you get the inn, which allows you at the end of the summer each year you get one of the two pip tokens which literally just allows you to add two to any role which is very very powerful and then the market allows you to take a, a die roll of any sort and go either up by one or down by one once per season. So once during the spring, summer, and fall. So in other words, if I roll a six and I've got the market, then I can either go on the five, the six, or the seven because I'm allowed to go up or down by one. So that's that's just a good thing to get right off the bat. Same thing for the Palisade. It doesn't give you any victory points, but it just gives you straight up plus one in battles, which is very helpful, right? And essentially, top row of the buildings, those primarily give you points. The next row uh, involves uh, being able to get more merchandise or be more flexible with regard to the roles. The third row is all about combat of different sorts, as is the fourth row. And then uh, the fifth row is a lot of combat, but also uh, some stuff with uh, production and earning more victory points uh, just by going through the game, right? And not necessarily by completing things, but just at the end of the season, you get this, okay? So, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and go through this base game, and then I will add in to Forge Your Realm uh, one by one, or uh, the modules one by one, and explain them so you guys can see what I'm talking about. But for now, we'll just go ahead and start right off with spring. We don't do the pre-spring thing because uh, none of us are below uh, as far as the number of buildings that we've got. So red rolls, black rolls, and green rolls. All right, so green rolled six, two, two, and two. That's kind of rough. Right, and black didn't do much better. Two, two, and three, and red, I got 14. Six, four, and four. So that means that red's going to be going last. I'll be in third, and then it will be black and green. Now we take turns, all right? We take turns placing all of our things. So for me, for red, I wanna, I wanna start off with an inn because I really wanna get that market. So I need to get some gold and some wood, but it's green's turn first. So what they're gonna do, they are going to spend two of their twos to go on that guy right there. They all have names, but I honestly do not remember what all the names are, and they will take a wood. For that next is black's turn and black is like oh well shoot now the dice are not hidden you know what everybody has black you can see that green has a two well i'm black i've got a two i'm gonna go on the two for the sole reason to stop green from doing it so that means that black gets a gold from that now red's turn. Well, red is pretty safe for the most part. Unfortunately, the four is gone, so can't do that. Can't do the six because don't have anything to trade in. The 10 is kind of nice because you get soldiers and you get to look at the thing. But right now, I really need to get some gold and some wood. So here's how we're going to do it. 
We're going to go on the eight. Four plus four is eight and get two gold. Okay. Next round. Green can't go on the two because somebody's already there. Next up, black got a total of five. So could get a soldier, but would rather get the wood. Right? So go goes on ahead and does that. Now that die is useless. And now red goes, going on the six, trades in a gold for a wood and a stone. Now everybody's dice are out. Nobody else can put anything else down. So everybody goes on ahead and builds. Red, I am going to build an inn for a wood and a gold. Just put the marker on there. Black is going to do the same thing. Build an inn. And then unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, green can't do much. They could build a barricade. They've got one wood, but the barricade doesn't do a whole lot unless it's a very specific bad guy. Okay, so now we move on. Everybody gets their dice back. Now we, we are in between spring and summer, so the person with the most houses or the most buildings gets to earn a victory point. If you're tied, then everybody does it. So black and red are tied for that. So they both move up to one victory point now. Okay, and we are now in the summer. Right, so everybody rolls. All right, so that's nine, that's 14 for green. That's eight for black. And 8, 9, 10, 11 for red. So now green is going last, black is first, and red is second. And we do the exact same thing. So now black is thinking, well, I kind of want that market too. That market is pretty sweet. I need to get two gold and two wood. Well, it's not going to happen this turn, that's for sure, unfortunately. So what you will do is... Go ahead and go on the seven. That means that they get to pick. So they will take a gold and they get the little pip here. Right? After that, red's turn. Red will, what will red do? Red will go on ahead and go on the eight again. Oops, wrong one. Six plus two is eight. Right, and then green, green's turn. Ooh, green, green, green. Green is going to be mean here and lock out the three for a wood. Back to the top with black. They've got a one. They will go ahead and get that jester for that free victory point. Red's turn with a three. Can't do anything because the three is locked out. Now green has 11, and they will happily go on the 11 for a stone and a gold. Building commences, if you are able. Black cannot build anything. Red is actually able to build something. Question is, do we want to? I don't know. Maybe. I think we will. We're going to go ahead and spend a gold and a stone to build the guard tower because that gives us plus one in battle, and it gives us a victory point, okay? We don't get that market, which is really sweet, but still. Next up is green. Green has a lot of options here, but we'll go for that nice in. Okay, so that is the end of summer. Because it's the end of summer, everybody who has an in gets one of these little two pip things, which means everybody gets one. So red gets one. Black gets one, and green gets one. So now we all have those little things. We all get our dice back. And now we move on to the king's emissary. The king's emissary is this unique little pawn token right here that allows you to either build a build twice, normally you can only build once, or it allows you to occupy the space influence the same person as somebody else who already has. So for example, when black had the three lockdown, then if I, if red had the three and the emissary, you can play the two of them together and play it on that same thing. Now the emissary goes to the person who has the fewest buildings, which right now is Technically nobody. These two are tied, but they can't both get the emissary. So unfortunately, nobody gets it. Okay. 
Now, the fall season, right? This is the last production season before we are attacked by whatever that is. Who knows what it is? Nobody actually knows what it is yet, right? So we go ahead and roll. Oops, forgot to die. Rolling, rolling. Oops, that was a four. And then this. Okay. So that's 11, 12, 13. And then that's 11, 15. So I think these guys just switch here. And that's it. All right, Black's turn. Black is going to go for that five. Get a soldier because we don't know what we're about to face. Next up is green, and green is going to go for that eight. Got to get that gold. Nothing wrong with that. Next up is red going for the 10, the nice commander. Right, so again, this gives me that nice little pink symbol, which means I can actually look at this card, right? Shh, don't tell anybody what it is. All right, so we've got barbarians. The barbarians are a strength two. That red band indicates that if you lose, then you will lose a random, well, not a random, you pick a specific, uh, well, you pick some resource to lose and you lose a building. But if you win, you get some gold, okay? Now, keep in mind on the back of these cards, This in, in this case, it says two to four. That's the strength range of the number ones. There's a whole lot of ones, twos, threes, and fours, and you randomly pick them at the beginning. So now only red technically knows who that is, but now we know we're fine because we're tied, and at the end, the king will actually send additional help as well. Okay, but going back to it, it is now black's turn again. They will go on this right here and get either a gold or a wood they will go ahead and take the wood okay and then next is green no can't go on the five but we've got this two pip here put the two pip on and now that five becomes a seven boom look at that now we're rocking it that means that we can get a wood and we get that little pip back okay now red has the same problem. Has a five, could use that to make it a seven, but the seven is blocked as well. So red is completely ousted. Red cannot do anything here, unfortunately. But they know what's coming. Okay, so that is the end of the fall production season. Now everybody gets to build again. Okay, so green will go on ahead and build that nice market there. All right, get that market going. That earns them one point. Black is unfortunately not really able to build anything. They'll go ahead and toss a wood at the barricade though, just so that they can have something, and maybe it's goblins. The barricade gives you a plus one specifically to goblins, so that might be good. Uh, and then red, unfortunately, is unable to build anything at all. Now, the last thing before everything attacks is we are able to purchase soldiers. We basically get mercenaries at a cost of two resources per. Now, technically, nobody can actually afford them right now, so it really doesn't matter. But if we had the money, we'd be able to. Okay, so we just move to eight, and now what happens? We flip this over. Everybody sees. It's barbarians. Ah! So now we roll the white die, and we see how many troops the king sends. The king will be sending two troops. So that means that red is now at four, black is now at three, and green is now at two. So that means that black and red both win. So they would get a gold each. Green has tied, which means that they don't win or lose. They don't get the reward, but they also do not get the punishment. Once you get to the point of the stone wall, which is one of the, uh, one of the buildings in the fourth row, then you win drawn battles. But right now, green is just lucky to have survived. Now, what if it had been even more lucky or uh, unlucky and the king only sent one troop? Wink. Now green has lost, and that means they lose a resource, and they also lose a building. The way that buildings are lost is it goes by essentially from the top right down to the bottom left. So if you've got it, the first thing that would go would be the cathedral, right? Anything in the farthest column and highest up is what you're going to be losing. So you do not want to lose most of these battles. They are all very, very bad, okay? But that's the end of that. Now we reset, go back to one, literally, 
The barbarians go away. This moves down to two. Everybody gets their dice back. That pip does not come back, though. Okay, and now whoever has the fewest buildings get in, gets an additional white die. In this case, since green has now lost that building, they get an extra die to roll along with their other three, right? And that's the basic means of how Kingsburg works. You can see how well it can mitigate some of the rolling, and not only that, but how it doesn't necessarily have charity, but it does have these nice minor catch-up mechanics, and while at the same time also rewarding you for doing a good job. If you've got the most buildings, then you're gaining victory points as well. And actually, I forgot, I got to reset these as well. These all go back down to zero at the end of the year. But that's basically it. So right now, I'm going to jump right on into to forge a realm and show you how that changes things. So I'm going to leave this as is, and I'm just going to add in some of the additional stuff that, get, that gives you and explain how it changes the way that the game works. All right, everybody. So I have taken out all the stuff for To Forge a Realm, the Kingsburg expansion that is currently out. There's actually not a whole lot that was added, but the thing is that they all drastically change the way that the game is played. First and foremost is that you can use, instead of the included building maps or the building cards, you can use these new ones that actually add an additional two rows of buildings. It still has the old Old buildings don't get me wrong but it has added two additional ones one at the top and one at the bottom and in this case it adds the the top row it has the sawmill quarry goldsmith and mint which actually allow you to trade in materials for gold at the end of uh, every summer and then you've got uh, some some pretty interesting new defense uh, mechanisms as well as uh, different ways of spending some of those two pips so that you can use them as goods instead uh, as well as getting uh, new ways of earning soldiers as well. So this just adds a lot more dynamic in the context of how the game will work and what you're able to build and what you're able to do with it. But then beyond that, you also have these individual strips. This is another technical, technically a module for them. So you can see on the side of the new cards, on the side of the new ones, you've got them labeled as A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. On these individual strips, they are also labeled as a, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and they change whatever's on there. So for example, the Sawmill, Quarry, Goldsmith, and Mint now becomes the Tilt Yard, Circus, Gladiator School, and Arena, which becomes a lot more based on victory and battle as opposed to goods and uh, trading in and getting gold and all that kind of stuff instead. The way that this particular module works with the strips is that you're supposed to put all of these out uh, individually. Uh, you just put them all face down and everybody just grabs two and then you can decide to use one both or neither of them and just keep what you've got you can also use these strips with the old cards as well if you want to but it just works a lot better with the new cards because the a through g is already matched up uh, so it just makes it a lot easier instead but basically the basic card goes on uh, just like that and i just flung my markers all over the place but it's okay they're just right here and my inn and my guard tower, right? So that's that. There, there are also options for uh, for bidding on certain cards and just all sorts of crazy stuff too. Uh, for for this, just being able to pick whichever ones that you want. So the uh, the other ones, there are three other major ones. The first one, the smallest one, actually involves these tokens here. Uh, these tokens actually replace that die roll at the end of the year for how many soldiers the king is going to send. Instead, each person picks one of these tokens, which have four, three, two, one, one, or zero. And that, that's the total number of soldiers. So you know you've got a total of six f over the course of five years that you're able to use. But basically, you can, uh, instead of rolling that die, you're saying, well, I'm really scared. Like, for example, with those barbarians, I already had two soldiers. I knew I was going to tie, so then I can just send one of my ones. And I know that I'm going to be okay as red.
right? Just as an example. But you know, maybe you're aiming to tie, maybe you're aiming to win, whatever. It doesn't make a difference. But it's very nice because that was really the last aspect of really major RNG that this game had, right? Rolling these three dice and then influencing influencing the different people can be mitigated by really good plays with the dice. And not only that, but a lot of the buildings will allow you to mitigate that as well because you get things like if you roll below 10, then you can re-roll all your dice. If you roll the same number, you can re-roll all of them, you know, that kind of stuff. So it just makes it uh, a lot more bearable. But with that die roll for those soldiers, you know, just arbitrarily between one and six, you have no idea. But these tokens do a great job of really eliminating that instead. So the last two things are these cards here. There's two different types of cards. You've got these, the, uh, the governor cards or... Um, they're basically people cards, and then what are uh, what are, uh, these cards are the destiny cards. The people cards, the governor cards, are the ones that you draw at the beginning of the game. You only get one in the entire game, but they give you some fairly substantial stuff. It's some pretty neat things. So, for example, here the philosopher in every productive season, if your dice total is ten or less, you may reroll all of them. There, boom. If your new total is lower, you get a victory point automatically. Okay? You may activate this power only once per season, but still, that's four times in the year, which is 20 times in the entire game. Okay, Princess, start the game with the King's Envoy, this little token here, and then you get a gold and a victory point. During phase one of the first year, only you will receive the King's help, which is an extra white die, because you're the princess, and she loves you, he loves you, you know, king, guy, whatever. Either way, cool stuff, right? And these range anywhere from, um, you know, like this one's kind of cool, the sculptor at the end of every year, you get a stone. When building, you can spend stone as if it were gold. Uh, there's, the, there's the thief who, uh, who starts off with more, uh, more gold, but you also start with, less, with uh, fewer victory points. You actually start in the negative victory points. You've got, um, you've got different ones that allow you to spend goods in different ways. Uh, here, the noble, you just automatically start with six uh, victory points. Uh, here's the thief. You start with four gold, but minus three of the uh, the victory points. Trickster is kind of cool. You can use the two pip tokens as if they were plus one or plus three, in addition to using them as the plus two. Just all sorts of cool abilities like that. It adds a really cool, essentially, roll mechanic to this game where you're already rolling dice. So you've got rolls on top of rolls. It's just ridiculous and totally meta, but it's really, really fun, and it adds a lot of spice and diversity to this game. And in addition, there are variants to how you actually can get those cards, ranging from bidding on them and saying, like, you will, uh, you'll, you can spend, quote-unquote, one victory point, which means that you will start at negative one victory point and stuff like that, right? Last but certainly not least are these destiny cards. The destiny cards have all sorts of different effects, but these are actually drawn at the beginning of every year. So you get a total of five during the game. Now, for example, surrounded, place face down a second enemy card for this year under this card. When using the, uh, the pink ghost face thing where you can look at it, a a player may check this card or the one on the game board. In winter, turn both cards face up and fight against the stronger enemy. If they're even, fight the enemy card that was on the game board. So in other words, you've potentially, you're have you dealing with two people, so ideally you would want to get that little pink ghost thing twice so you can look at both of them. Uh, these range anywhere from... Uh, being good to bad to absolutely terrible. So for example here, at the beginning of each productive phase, roll one die with a result of four or more. Each player receives one stone. New quarry. That's pretty nice. That's very helpful for, for a year there. Um, urban expansion in every productive season. Players not owning the the crane or the carpenter, which are uh, two of the buildings, may pay one gold less when building in columns three and four, the last two columns, and players owning the crane or the carpenter paid one gold less of their 
or of their choice when building columns one and two. So just decreasing the cost. Most of those cards are pretty good. Some of them are rather devastating. There's one, uh, for example, where the king is sick for this entire year. You cannot influence the king. And then if you get that card a second time, the king is dead and the game is over. So... That's kind of unpleasant, uh, but there obviously there there's multiple of certain cards there. Uh, here's a cool one: good trades at the end of every productive season after the construct building step. Each player may trade with the supply one good for a different good of his choice, only once per season, which is pretty amazing because obviously normally you don't do that. So this is the modularity of to forge a realm, and one of the reasons that I love it so much. I absolutely adore this. None of these modules really relies on the other. The only thing that is close to that is these individual strips here that replace the boards really are a lot better off if you have the larger boards. You don't absolutely need to have them though. But these tokens for the soldiers, the destiny cards, the governor cards, all of those completely independent of everything else absolutely no reason to use all of them together but also no reason to not use them all together it doesn't you don't necessarily feel pressured to use all of these things you also don't pressure feel pressure to use none of them it's really really amazing and it adds so much additional depth to this game but either way i'll go ahead and stop rambling here that's it for my demo for kingsburg as well as its expansion to forge a realm i hope that you learned a little bit about it i hope that you enjoyed this portion but right now i'm going to head right on into my conclusions and also my pros and cons for this great game so going into the pros and cons of kingsbury i only have a, a few relatively minor notes first off the really major con is that it is still rng now the thing is that this is something that is unavoidable in any game ever always all the time Whatever it is, whether it's drawing cards or rolling dice or anything, you always have the random number generator. You have the randomness. But the problem with this game is that really, if you are consistently rolling something like below 10 total uh, on, on all your dice, then you are far behind. You will end up uh, getting uh, farther behind. And it does have the minor catch-up mechanics, which I am okay with in, in this context. For a lot of people, those types of catch-up mechanics are really cons, simply because it feels really artificial. But for for a game like this, I think it makes sense uh, because, again, that it really does, in this context, help to mitigate a lot of those factors. Uh, one of the pros that I really like is this is a relatively minor version uh, as far as the, um, not inventory, but the resource management uh, that a lot of other games employ. Um, it's a it's a fairly simple means of, of doing something that a lot of other games make very, very complicated. Uh, Another somewhat minor gripe con for this is the length of time. I, Whenever I talk about this game, normally I'll talk about it in the context of being able to play with new players. People who aren't used to Euro-style games, aren't used to like the hobby type games and things of that nature. And the problem is that in that context with new people, it is still a fairly long game. You're talking about like about an hour to an hour and a half which can end up making people very tired and bored. Whereas something like Seven Wonders or uh, even something like Cash and Guns taking only about a half hour, much, much better, much faster, and uh, probably better for those types of people. But at the same time, this does a really good job of introducing a lot of mechanics that people are gonna be seeing throughout all sorts of different hobby style games. Uh, as far as other cons are concerned, I personally really don't have any. Uh, to Forge a Realm, a great expansion that also serves to mitigate a lot of the RNG that the base game has, uh, but there's there's just really not a whole lot that's bad with this game. It is one of my favorite games of all time. I really love it. I love the way that it handles the dice rolling. I, uh, I do... It's not something I mention a lot, but I like the art. I think that it's appropriate for the theme and the setting that we're talking about. Um, but again, that's that's a very, very minor thing, even for me. I really don't talk about aesthetics pretty much at all, ever. But either way, it's a wonderful game. If you haven't gotten a chance to do so, give it a try at least. Uh, see, see what you think about it. I think it's a great game. I always have a blast playing it. A lot of people that I play with really enjoy it. Most of the people that I play with who don't like it really comp complain about about the time and the dice rolling. So that's why those are my two cons. But um, as always, please put any and all feedback in the comments below. 
I, I am trying to make uh, my videos a little bit better in terms of higher quality video and audio, so uh, hopefully that's coming through at least a little bit. Um, but just let me know, is there any way that I can improve these? I've asked a couple of times if you guys would like to have a rating system uh, for these games that I can give you so that you have a little bit more of a concrete, uh, something to grab onto uh, for whether or not to play or how good it is, whatever it happens to be. But either way, Kingsburg, great game. Give it a try if you haven't already. Put any feedback that you want in the comments below. Totally agree, totally disagree. Uh, somewhere in between, whatever it is. Or if you have a game in mind that you'd like to see me review, put that in there as well. So with that, thank you so, so very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time. Thank you very much again for watching and I hope that you enjoyed my review and gameplay demo for Kingsburg and to Forge a Realm. As always, please leave any and all feedback in the comments below, including any suggestions for other games you'd like to see me review. As always, I've got several of my playlists linked up at the top so that you can check out some of my other work. And please do click that big giant subscribe button if you want to see more from me in the future. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter for new video and live stream announcements. Thank you very much again for watching, and I will see you next time.